Hi, my name is Chris Kanetsky. I'm the publisher and executive editor for the Des Moines Business Record. We're here today to host a roundtable for our annual real estate magazine that came out on April 24th of this year. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the office segment of the real estate industry. This is one of five roundtables that we're doing, taking a look at the entire real estate and development issue. In each video, we're going to explore different topics and trends and issues, and today we've got a great panel for you. Uh, Kathy Bolton is our senior staff writer. She puts together our commercial real estate weekly e-newsletter and writes about real estate and development. She's got a variety of questions questions for our panel today. Uh, you'll see her scribbling away and taking some notes because she's going to be working to put together the, the article for the magazine uh, that uh, comes out in April. Um, although we've got this uh, camera rolling today, we're, we're looking into the camera right now, but we're going to have a conversation amongst ourselves. So uh, feel free to be able to fly on the wall. We'll go ahead and kick it off. Kathy, why don't you go ahead and start with the first question. Uh, thanks for being here today. Um, our first question is, where do you see the office sector heading in 2020 in central Iowa? And as you, let's go down the row and answer and say your names and where you're from first. Jan Berg with CBRE, Hubble Commercial. And I see office moving down a path of looking at the employee and their needs and their environment desires. Um, we have... We have less need for office space that is in the um, market for lease, uh, less need for that because a lot of our corporate headquarters have chosen to vacate a leasing situation and move into um, owner, you know, um, occupied. Thank you. And um, the key there is since we have such a low unemployment rate that the employers and landlords need to be looking at an environment that is interesting and conducive to the employee's needs. So I think there's going to be more looking into additional amen amenities and how they can make their space more interesting than maybe some other opportunity. That way they have recruitment and uh, to retain these employees as their main focus. I would really agree with everything Jan said, and I would really add that as that need develops or for trying to attract and retain employees in the office space that they occupy, you're going to see more amenities added, whether it's uh, conference rooms, huddle rooms, uh, workout rooms, uh, public meeting spaces. Uh, we're just going to see an expansion of that. Uh, the way also I think many companies are trying to figure out how to get into the work at home and split time between the office and home space too. So how people use office space is definitely shifting, which is affecting how the trend will go in the greater Des Moines market, both in the downtown and the suburbs. I'm Sarah Herman with SVPA Architects. Um, I'm vice president there and in charge of director of interior design. So um, I have a little bit of a different perspective that we're starting to see uh, people try and really exhibit their culture um, and their brand. And so, um, as Jan mentioned, you know, the, the unemployment rate is really low and they're competing out there for employees and they want their space to reflect who they are because they're trying to, the minute that that person comes in for an interview or walks their foot in the door, they wanna make sure that they're representing who they are and they're realizing that space can be one of the most critical components to um, that hiring process. So. Um, kind of just projecting their company culture and their values is, is what we're really starting to see be exhibited through space. Hi, I'm Brittany Freund, uh, Vice President with r, &R Real Estate Advisors. Um, I would concur with all three of you. Uh, we do have quite a bit of uh, spec space available uh, online right now. We also have some large companies that have vacated space or are going to be um, vacating some lease space. Um, so there are options out there for tenants. Um, I think some tenants are going to be looking for a change, including some larger tenants. Um, sometimes it's easier to start from scratch and implement some of these new design ideas um, in a fresh space. So I think we'll just see a little bit of movement this year. If I may add, I think we also are going to see more landlords who have existing properties that are definitely second generation and more who are going to say to themselves we got to create an experience the culture that you mentioned and so we need to look at spending some money on our property it's outdated it doesn't have 
It doesn't have the layout to accommodate the experiences and the culture. So I think we'll see people who are looking at their property that has become somewhat obsolete, and they're either going to repurpose it or they're going to make sure they're updating it to a point that is meeting those needs for the, the, the employee. Very good. Let's, let's talk about some of those vacancy rates. What are we seeing? What kind of vacancy rates are, are we experiencing now? And what do we think is going to happen over the next you know, year or two? Go ahead. Actually, we do have several larger um, spaces involved in our market because of these um, different headquarters choosing to build their own building. So we do have a lot of large space. Um, the numbers I came up with was 1.4 million in the market of vacancy over 10,000 square feet. And that's kind of interesting because it's hard to find space that is under 10,000 square feet right now. But um, over 10,000, we have 1.4 million. And the interesting fact is that it's almost split equally between downtown and the western suburbs. And I think people focus on, oh, there's all that vacancy in downtown, but you're dealing with a more concentrated area to have these vacancies. So, um, you know, we're still always running about 12%. I actually went back through presentations that I've done over the last 30 years, and interestingly enough, the vacancy stays 12%, maybe up to 14%, which is kind of interesting. So things ebb and slow, um, ebb and flow because of the change in the market and what's the desire and what becomes Class C and it's obsolete and it gets taken off the market and new headquarters being built leaves a big chunk of property available. So I think it's interesting you talked about the equilibrium between the two mm -hmm. because I think as we've done these type of roundtables over the last few years, you kept hearing people talking about the benefits of downtown and then also really quickly talk about the benefits of, of being out in the suburbs for their office space. And so just kind of curious that we're at that point. Have you seen equilibrium like that in the past or is that kind of an, a relatively new, new issue? No, there's really always been some equilibrium to the market. And really, as we've talked about corporate culture, there are some companies, both national companies and local companies, that really do have a culture that they want to be in a vibrant downtown, so they've made the investments to stay in the downtown. And so, and at the same time, there's some people that want to go out to the suburbs and they want free parking and they want other amenities that they wouldn't necessarily get downtown. So that really becomes the mix, and there is equilibrium in the market. And, you know, really historically, I think the worst vacancy we saw in downtown Des Moines was really right during the the downturn, right before the downturn, it was probably about 25%. And that's when you saw the Liberty Building, the Des Moines Building, uh, the Midland Building, and a number of buildings get repurposed into, you know, apartment housing. And, and so, you know, that's really the cycle that happens. In other parts of the country, we haven't seen it yet in Des Moines because we haven't had the vacancy issues. Older suburban office parks are either leveled or turned into other uses, too. It's not unusual. And I might add that um, that ebb and flow has happened for the last 30 years that I've been involved in, and right. Kevin too. So it, when these properties become obsolete, they either find a new purpose or they're removed from, from our inventory. They just, like you said, the suburban offices might be torn down or downtown they're torn down. So with this vacancy rate, will it be absorbed before we see new construction of office space or? What's going to happen? Brittany? Yeah, I think there's quite a bit of spec space still online. Um, so I don't know that many developers are planning new spec office buildings right now. I have heard of some uh, multi-use buildings in the works or, you know, being thought of. Um, but I think we have uh, enough spec space currently as well as those large companies vacating. Um, between John Deere, IMT, Salmons, Holmes, Murphy, and Come and Go, there's over 400,000 square feet that's already online or coming along, um, online here in the next few years that um, we're going to have to backfill. So there's, I mean, I don't think that there's a need for spec space at this time. Are, are those spaces, some of the ones that you mentioned, have opportunities for multiple users in them? Yeah. Sure. I, they can be divided. So 
not not to steal, but I mean, you know, where where Sammons is moving out of there in a building that's a, just under 100,000 square feet of usable space and 24,000 feet of floor. So I mean, that could be leased, in partial floors, whole floors, multiple floors, and and then really the same thing's true with some of the other build a suit activities. Uh, Jan uh, relocated uh, IMT. Their building will be coming online, and they've been that's been on the market for sublease. And, and then that'll be coming online with R&R &R at the end of this year, I believe, is it? Three years. three years left. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Yeah. But I'd like to also add, <laughs> you don't see much speculative building, but in the downtown market, we do have some new office buildings. We've got 111 East Grand. There's another opportunity on the south side of the um, parking garage to have another building go up. It'll probably be more mixed use and more apartments because of the need for parking. But then you also have George Sherman looking at putting up a building on Martin Luther King. That's because there isn't any, there's a demand and there hasn't been anything built in that area. Now it was delayed for about seven years. So again, it's that ebb and flow. You have to kind of wait for the need to be there. Right, I, I really think that there'll be very little spec space and, and really you know, what developers like Sherman are hoping for is that they'll get that anchor tenant that would be a 50, 60 percent user, and then they'll go ahead and build a building, and then have some additional rental spec space available. And you know, and at the same time, then the the market district uh, is is coming, you know, is in the planning stages right now. But there's really two or three decent sized office users in that space right now, looking at the future. So I think we will see some build a suit activity, but they'll already have tenants in tow for for most of the activity. So that space we have available now, and we talked a little bit about people wanting a good environment. Sarah, what are you seeing tenants wanting, clients wanting new that's in, in their office spaces? Yeah, um, well, I think we're seeing a, a big push for natural light. Natural light has always been something that people have gravitated to. So um, when you talk through, you know, um, Salmon's, for instance, as they're, you know, taking their building or that building is gonna be repurposed. Um, that ability to have, you know, it's an open floor plate with a lot of window um, access, and you can easily convert that to to make sure that a lot of employees would have access to natural light. We're seeing um, a push away from kind of the um, the perimeter office concept that that shuts that down, and so the the spaces that tend to have that bigger floor plate where it's conducive to bringing offices on the internal footprint are ones that um, our clients are tending to gravitate to and really be interested in um, from that standpoint. And again, this major amount of vacancy that we're getting, as you mentioned, 400,000 just along West Town Parkway, um, those properties in a way have become obsolete in the way that they've been finished because they have the offices all the way around the outside. They may not have as much light and windows. They're a little heavy and finish, which this is again, if it becomes obsolete or not as desirable, the landlord has to put money into it. And, and it's fairly costly. And if it's a 23,000 square foot floor plate, they need to put a center corridor down the middle, break it up into smaller spaces because as I mentioned, Underneath 10,000 square feet, we don't have many options. So, right, I, I, I'd concur with Jan. A, a lot of landlords are facing reinvestment in properties, and the the hard question for them is: Do we take imp improvements out at the risk of having somebody that would want those improvements, or do we take them out and 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 just wait for the market to come? And you know, right now, I think we've seen your company do both. You know, just depending on the space and depending on how heavy the improvements were. And so it really, that's a dilemma for all the landlords, in whether it's A or B space. And you know, A and B space is really kind of just by pricing in terms of the age of the property was probably built and delivered to the market. I just have a question. You, we're talking about vacancy rates and, or occupancy rates. And you start talking about the design changes and the challenges that that has on older buildings, and you talk about work from home, and you talk about um, the desires for new ty new types of spaces. It seems like that would be creating a really, really big challenge within office, but the occupancy rates are actually staying relatively healthy. So, I'm just curious why you think that would be? <laughs> why you think that would be? I mean, maybe, or and just maybe the less space that people are using too within their offices. Well, I I, I think coming out of the downturn. 
there was really a lack of building and the market really caught up with itself. And now we've had a plethora of builder suits for companies building for their own account and, and you know, going into their corporate headquarter buildings. And that's leaving the backlog of existing space now. I think the future, the next 24 months, and I think we probably have a three year supply of office space right now based on normal historical data. And it'll be interesting to see how that is absorbed and on some of the second generation space, what the requirement is that, that the people, that the users will have to make that functional space so it's desirable to, to occupy. I think one of the other things too is we're seeing that although people are reducing like their, their real estate footprint per employee, they're also bringing a lot of amenities and things like that into their space. So um, they may not be lessening the total amount of square footage that they're doing. They're just providing it differently. So instead of you know the typical larger private office or the larger size workstation, we're seeing a lot more of open collaboration spaces, of conferencing areas, of um, huddle areas where they can have those kinds of stand-up meetings where they can do some amenities like fitness centers and things like that. So they may be keeping the same or even growing their real estate footprint to some degree. It's just they're repurposing it for different things and really trying to bring a benefit to the employee saying, you don't, you don't need all that square footage just that you own. Let's give that back so that it becomes more of a, a group. And, and a you know what effort. else is so important to that is integrated technology. It has driven design of office since the 80s. And I, I can talk about that when we talk about interiors. But if you look at all these things, the key is, do you have integrated technology so I can go and use whatever space I choose? And I don't have to work in the typical you know, known office space. Yeah, I mean, five years ago, even when we would meet with clients, um, you know, they had probably 50% on laptops, something to that nature. And now when we go into places, um, almost 90% of their, their employees are on laptops or some way to make them not tethered to a desk, which gives them a whole lot more opportunity. And, and although we're really just starting to see the beginning of what 5G is supposed to be to space or to, to users, 5G from what we, I've been told is that it's gonna revolutionize space the way that the laptop and the PC did and the cell phone and that they, you know, combining all that change, which is hard to think about in 20 something years, that 5G will change that again as far as accessibility for information in the office, which will give employers a lot of flexibilities to where their employees go. Can you talk a little bit more about how, how you see that affecting the office space? Well, right now, if, if everybody's working in a wireless environment, you you know, depending on how they have their phones wired, if they're voice over IP, if they're tied into the technology, you know, literally people can have desks with wheels or, you know, there's a number of employers now that don't have assigned seating in their work areas. They might have a, a well, one company calls it a neighborhood and other areas, you know, just call it, you know, work areas where a, 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 an employee may come in and he does not have a desk with the picture of his family on their cube it's, it's literally that they're coming in with their backpack and they're unloading and they're putting their PC out and you know maybe a flower or whatever they want to bring into work that day. And, and literally when they're done, they pack it up and go home and so they don't have space. Uh, a couple of the employers downtown here that have open space plans, literally if you're not in early, you may not get to sit where you wanted to sit that day. And we're also hearing of where sometimes people want to have a meeting and they don't know if all their employees are there and they're texting, trying to find out if they can gather on a floor. In a nutshell, it provides total flexibility. Yeah. Yep. I would concur, flexibility is key. Um, I think a few years ago, more employers were uh, moving towards the work from home idea, um, but finding that they were losing some connection with their employees, and so having space available, even though it's not your personal space, uh, but something that they can come and find a seat um, is important to employees. Right. And they try to create communities, neighborhoods. So if that happens to be your community, then you'll find a desk. Um, you don't wander out into a different community so that you keep some sort of collaboration and um, community for the group of people that should work together. And each- So Sarah, what sort of opportunities, challenges does that present to you when somebody comes and says, we want the flex space, we want the huddle areas? What are you doing today to design that versus maybe what you did 10 years ago? 
Um, well, I think some of the, the opportunities is they can, they can flux their numbers, so we don't have to pay so much attention to their growth. Um, it's, it's a pretty sustainable approach. You don't have to plan ahead that they can build out all these offices or have all this workstation space because if it's a flexible environment, as their population grows or shrinks, um, it gives them more opportunity for those, those people to be in. Because you've done collaboration spaces or it's spaces where they work based on their function for that day, um, you're not so, so tethered to their growth population. Um, I think the challenge, and you know, it's been out there for many years now, is there's a lot of backlash to open office, and um, you know, people say that they're easily distracted, that the noise volumes, you know, that there's there's a lot of of challenges working in that environment. Many of them can be overcome, um, but I do think that you have to, as employers, they have to create space that can be utilized by all employees. So whether that's creating some some quiet spaces, whether that's, um, you know, we've seen a lot of uh, phone booth or enclave type spaces where employees, when they need a heads down focused kind of day, they can check out or go into those types of spaces and eliminate a lot of those distractions. Um, so it's just something that, you know, people have to be aware of when they're starting to plan out their space and make sure that um, a lot of the challenges that are identified can be overcome. And very seldomly now do we actually go in working with clients that no one will tell you they have enough huddle rooms and enough conference space. They always, they always need more. So, I mean, that's a big, big, big requirement. We talked about attracting new employees and having um, work environment or office space that reflects the work environment. Can any of you give examples of what that might look like or of clients that have done that? Well, I mean, I think that y you have some companies that really want to attract that younger um, that younger employee, and so they give off, it's almost like a college campus type of vibe. That's what they, they want to brand themselves, they want to have opportunities like that. So you might see the gaming rooms and some of those things that are brought on board. Others realize, you know, that their culture is still something that, you know, we see sometimes in like the financial markets and things like that. Um, that's not their company culture and they don't feel like they should represent that. So um, they might still do, you know, it, it might be look a little different. There's still a collaboration and there's still those types of things that happen, but they're just done differently. A lot of companies have really started to brand themselves throughout their building too. So, um, you know, really illustrating your core values, your mission statements, making sure that employees remember what your company stands for, and they want that to be throughout the building and done in a tasteful way. Um, so we've seen a lot of that incorporated into the architecture and design of the space. One of the things that, exactly along those lines, if you get to tour a lot of these new buildings, be it uh, John Deere, IMT, Merchants Bonding, Holmes Murphy, and I'm probably gonna leave somebody out, but all of those buildings really reflect that company's culture, whether it's in collision space, uh, common area, places where people can work. I, it, it really does reflect in that even though their buildings are all built within, say, 24 months of each other, there's similarities, but there's unique differences in each one, too. I think I'd like to add to that, that it's not only culture, but it's the type of work you do. For example, at our office, we do have some structured offices, and if you're in brokerage, that's more likely to work to your benefit because of the confidentiality or the calls that you have. And then there's other sections of the business who truly do best in open office, and they're no longer 62 inches high or 80 inches high as we started in the 80s. They're now maybe not even a, a divider wall at all. It's 42 inches high. Or maybe 54, but more like 42 inches high above the surface or above the floor to give you a little privacy. So it's culture, it's environment, but it's functionality of the type of work you do. Yep, I would agree with that. I think four or five years ago, people were being driven towards more of the open office concept um, in that trend. And as they're doing that, I think other companies are seeing that that doesn't always work for your company and I, I feel like the new trend is designing a space that fits your company culture and your needs which is not always necessarily an open concept. Sarah, 
what are some maybe misperceptions or when you're working with, with businesses uh, when they first come to the table that you find yourself maybe correcting or, or trying to lead them down a different path? I think one of the biggest ones is we have a lot of confidential information. So everybody has confidential things that cross their desk and not everybody requires it to be in a private office or a private space or something where visibility is entirely cut off. Um, we have HR people that often want their entire unit you know, behind a glass wall or closed off and things. And so often there are some situations where that is, that is exactly true, but then we just have to have a dialogue. Well, well, how frequently does that happen? If you could position yourself so you're not right on the, the walking path or things like that where a lot of employees are going to go, like could we do something different in that respect without having to put everybody behind walls and doors and, and things like that? Um, the other one, too, that I, I think we hear is um, people, people want their growth to be accommodated, but then they, they also want to make sure that they, um, they want to give their employees the, the maximum amount of space that they need. And sometimes you can grow into that maximum space by, and repurpose it, not just within that, that individual's workplace, but... Um, allowing conferencing spaces and things like that where all of a sudden they don't have to do conference calls at their, their desk. You've given them opportunities where they can come together and do, and do things like that. So just kind of working through their growth and their expectations of how to manage that growth, I think, has been something that we've, we've had challenges with. Anything else from the other panelists when you guys are working with, with different clients? Well, I was just going to mention, again, I come back to technology has driven everything that we're doing. Five, seven years ago when we started pushing the open office format, it was driven by our younger generations who have always had technology all their life. And they function by, hey, they whip out their their laptop, they make their communications, they do whatever they need, their research, and it doesn't matter where they are. And I believe that that's where that thought came in. So, ooh, let's try the open office. Not only is that the way they live, but we need to encourage those young people as employees. So everything seems to go overboard a little bit, and then you have to pull it back after you find how do people function best, and how do they function within the type of work they do. Well, I think one of the things that's interesting, too, is you go to any given Starbucks or you go down to Smoky Row or something like that, and people are working. So they're working in a very loud setting, in a very vibrant, where there's a lot of people and a lot of action. So it proves that you can work in those types of things, and some people enjoy that and actually are more productive with that. But then there's definitely others that, you know, libraries still exist for a reason. There's still study carols out there and things like that. And so it just, you have to accommodate all types of people in the way they work. Nobody's really talked about it, but white noise is really a common tool in open space that really does dull the tone so that you really don't overhear conversations. And then the other thing that you notice, and again, Jan was talking about the younger generation, is their proliferation of people working with their earbuds in and whether they're streaming music, listening to a TED Talk, whatever they're doing, they're doing their work, but at the same time, they're, they're, they're creating their own distraction in a way and keeping their head down and just doing their work. It's interesting when you talk about white noise, there's some buildings, older buildings, that almost have inherent white noise because of their HVAC systems and things like that. And so there's sometimes where we encounter that and we're like, you don't actually need it because you have this built in. So as, as some of those older buildings come online and things like that, it's, it's interesting what's out there. So we talked a lot about the space inside of a building. What about the space outside of the building? What are people asking for now and what are you doing that maybe you didn't do five or 10 years ago? Yeah, I think uh, we're seeing more glass these days. Um, parking is important, so it's still kind of in the building, but underground parking, um, rooftop patios, that's something that we've added to a few of our buildings, um, just outdoor seating areas. So we've incorporated food trucks into our parks, um, and with that, people need a place to sit. So we've invested in um, upgrading some of our outdoor seating areas so that they have a place when they you know, stand in line, grab their food. Um, they can just hang out outside and um, visit with other folks that are also eating. Um, We've, we've also seen people where they make sure that the wire, Wi-Fi is ready to be outside so people can work outside too. So um, uh, we're working on Salmon's corporate headquarters right now, and there's areas outside where it's intended for people to go and to work and have that ability to take their laptop out there. So it's a, an extension of the workplace now. 
in addition to that outdoor space, it needs to be something that's inviting and that each individual employee feels like they can use. For example, water features, walking trails, a signature look to the building. Now you can take an older building, but you gotta invest the money and just create something that sets it apart from the one next to it. Um, we, we used to like to have everything look the same, and I think we're shifting again, in which we do in our business, shifting away to have something that's signature, for example, like the timber building. And it has, that's inside and outside because it has all the, vault, the, um, the open ceilings with all the timber as a part of your finish. You don't have to add all the drywall, all the ceilings. It becomes an integral part of the finish, the interior finish. So, and then I think you should add, uh, Brittany, their group uh, also includes a car that's not rented. It's, it's cars that are new, that are features, that you can come and check it out. And then people try out something that they wouldn't have an opportunity to do. So. Talk about that, Brittany. Um, one of the amenities that um, we've, r, r has partnered with Willis Auto Campus, um, and Willis has been providing two vehicles. Um, we call it the uh, Westfield Auto Club. Uh, so anyone in the building is able to go down to the concierge and check out the keys and just take it to a work meeting or a work lunch and, and then come check them back in. And those are switched out every two weeks typically. And what has been the reaction of employees to that? Uh, depends what car's there that week, but um, it's very, it was very exciting. I mean, there was a wait list at one point when they first started it because people were so excited to get to try these new vehicles. Um, it's died down a little bit, but people are still get excited about the amenity. The ideal situation is that they're looking at the tenant and their needs and their desires and adding that to the feature of the property. So um, a recent study came out that said that about, and we've touched on this a little bit, 70% of professionals now work remotely at least one day a week and 53% work remotely at least half of the week. So what are companies doing to reimagine and redesign their office spaces to meet those employees' needs? But also, um, does that mean we need less office space if there are more and more people are working at home? Not. Not yet. I, I, I think how, how companies measure their productivity and how they, you know, whether it's their month-end P&L uh, production, I think that how they manage an, a home employee is different, like how long is their computer on, how many clicks are, you know, there's just different ways that they're measuring that. And so that becomes part of the challenges to is is the home environment conducive to working at home? If if somebody's young and they have young children at home, it's really hard to work at home. If you know, so I mean, it, it just depends on who the people are. If you're an empty nester, it's not a problem. I think some of the companies too that have taken that approach, um, it's hard to predict when your employees, if you're truly giving them the flexibility, it's hard to predict when they're coming in the office. So having space like the unassigned workspace. It works really well for that type of a, a culture um, because you still need to accommodate them when they come in the office. And often when they're coming in the office is when they want to collaborate with their team members, which means that their team might all be coming together on that same day. So um, you have to be strategic with how you approach that space. Often it's you're still using the same amount of conference rooms, that you're still including the same amount of collaboration space. Um, you might just have more drop-in stations where their footprint might be a little smaller because if they are only gonna be there two, three days a week, they don't necessarily need a lot more of that, that assigned space. Again, it depends on the type of work you do. And I think they're cutting back on people doing at-home uh, tele or teleconferencing or whatever. I just think they're they're going to see that as less productive and they're gonna reduce that opportunity. I know of some companies who have already done that here in town. But the other side of it is, those people that like that kind of flexibility are probably more like going to be in your co-working spaces mm -hmm. that we have because that functions for their kind of business. But to answer your first question, yes, I do believe we have already seen a reduction in office and we will continue to see a reduction. In, in that, going to that really, the old adage was really, if you had one job, you'd have one seat for that job. And now we're seeing that there might be, you know, really, you know, two or three jobs with one seat. 
And that's really something that you've got to plan around that we're seeing now that people are saying, okay, you know, we have 150 employees, but we might only wind up with 125 seats. And, you know, there's really, we have this public area so that the day that everyone's here for some reason, there's places for them, but it's not assigned work areas. And that also became quite evident with several of our headquarters here, specifically in downtown, that have numbers of people, lot high numbers of people. Um, when we started with the open office systems furniture in the 80s, that's when it became popular because it was considered um, a tax write-off. It was not, it was depreciated a different schedule. It became very popular. That's when we started with the hoteling seats that were flexible seats. Then, and the, and the, and the walls were 62, 80 inches high. Um, you know, that didn't work so well because, for example, principal or nationwide, whatever, they would find, oh, this doesn't work. We need to change our community of workers they were tearing down office systems furniture every day. It was quite lucrative for the furniture companies, but it was very costly for the companies. And so now that you're doing what you're saying is we have more collaboration. The same person or three people might use the same workstation. So we've come up with a new way of handling that. And you don't have the high walls. You don't have as many systems furniture being torn down and moved and the flexibility of the new furniture it's on casters. So we talked briefly, mentioned briefly about co-working space. Um, do we, are we gonna see more of that in the Des Moines area and what's it, it gonna look you like? You know, so nationally we saw the uh, rise and fall of WeWork and we in about were- a, In about a year, <laughs> right? Well, no, actually, it, it, it actually, it was, you know, it, it actually was about a five-year-old company, but they were trying to ramp up to go public, and so they doubled in size, and what they found is that they doubled their losses. It was kind of a math problem, but they, um, and, and, and so what we work proved is that, like a lot of other things, there's limits to the market, okay? So it's just like, how many restaurants can we support? How many gym, gym, uh, gyms, you know, workout places can we support in a community our size? And so there's room for collaborative workspace but like a lot of other things, it's really what the market will bear. And you know, right now, I, I would say that you know, we have enough or a number of workspaces, and unless someone really comes out with some new widget that's gonna attract new people, I think that you know, we're probably at a, a stable level in that space right now. I don't know if you agree, Jan. I would agree. And the interesting thing that I've observed is that if it's a WeWork type of space or Gravitate or Regis or whatever, and it's in the downtown market, it needs to be at grade level. In the West Des Moines or suburbs, it's not quite as important because it's a whole different environment, but I think it needs to be on grade level to survive downtown. Did, did WeWork end up ever taking any space around here? I know last no, year they, there was talk looked, about that. They, they were in the market at one time, but no, they've actually, They've been, uh, their, their bank uh, has really foreclosed on that company and they're kind of unwinding what they did because, you know, this time last year, I think they had leased about half the vacant office space in Boston, New York, Philadelphia, and other East Coast cities, in San Francisco, uh, West Coast cities also. And so they literally are kind of unwinding what they started. And WeWork actually thought that they could sublease for a profit and you know, I don't think I've ever done a sublease which it actually costs more than the regular tenant was paying. I don't have you, have you? No, I, I, you know, and so you know, WeWork's thought was, well, we'll, we, we'll control the space and everyone will have to lease from us and we'll give them ultimate flexibility. Well, people weren't willing to pay a premium for that flexibility. So that was really you know, WeWork's ultimate demise. It was, a, it was a social experiment that failed. And the cost of it to the user is actually higher than you think for um, a more flexible, smaller, where it's what they call the hot desk, so you move from here to there, um, you're actually paying just under $200 a month. And if you're in a space where you have your own space, it's closer to 400 a month. So, you know, we used to have, um, uh, con uh, what do we call them? Concourses. That was the first idea back in the 80s and 90s. Concourse where a person had all these, and they were individual offices. That worked well, but then it became less interesting because people didn't have collaboration spaces. So that's when the WeWork, the Regis came into to play. And so I, th I thought it was interesting 
when when we were talking about we work a lot last year they talked about how they were actually trying to set it up though that they could end up being the consultant to ultimately help them find other other office space so it's kind of an interesting idea or an interesting thought though around some of those small companies that might be getting ready to to grow it was interesting because uh really all the national firms cbre cushman and jll all were starting to experiment with that space and i think now that with the failure of we work i think i haven't really read anything about the national firms working in that space or really pushing that platform anymore so I don't know, Chris, if that's really viable versus, you know, the traditional way that uh, office tenants have really found space. Uh, you know, our market hasn't necessarily been affected uh, from the upstream marketers in terms of, you know, how how people find office space. So we've talked a little bit about the, the labor shortage here, 2.5% um, unemployment. When potential users of office space are looking here, what is it that they're are they concerned about being able to find employees? And and what are you telling them about um, how to go about doing that? Or what are they looking for so they can attract those employees? Yeah. I think that a lot of companies moving to Des Moines will do their homework and they'll have their HR people in here looking and seeing what's a, what the workforce is. Uh, you know, I think that uh, some of the national or the local companies here that have national footprints become targets and that we've, we've had a lot of uh, uh, national firms come in from Austin, Texas and San Jose that are programmers and they're looking for experienced programmers from these larger companies to come to work for them. And so we've actually seen them come in here and, you know, their whole you know, modus operandi is that they're going to steal employees from other people. And I don't think our low employment rate is really I mean, discouraging companies from coming here because they look at not only do we have low employment, that says something else to them. It says we have quality workers. It says we have high educated workers. And so I think they're willing to come here and as Kevin said, steal employees. And they know that we're a finance and insurance industry as well as ag, and, and they see that as a quality. So I don't really think it's keeping them away. I, I think employee recruitment comes up in every meeting that we have when we're talking about new space or, or developing space. Um, that seems to be at the forefront of what employers are talking about. Um, and they have started realizing that space can be a real attractor for that. Um, it's also retention. I mean, you know, we all know that keeping employee in you know, that's much less than hiring new employees all the time. And so they're, they're understanding the benefit of making sure that their employees stay with them. Um, and so they've started realizing that to put something into their space and to quality, you know, to provide quality space for their employees can be something that will really help that. So Sarah, you're saying the design becomes crucial. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. you know, we know there's going to be low in employment, but we know their quality, but they're really looking to you to help create that unique culture, environment, experience, and yeah, absolutely. so design has become more valuable. You know, like years ago, a lot of college campuses put rock walls into their student centers or their fitness areas, and it was really, I heard somebody say one time that, like, it's amazing how many kids commit to a college based on that feature. You know, like, they just think this is a really cool place, this is where I want to be, and employers started seeing, like, it's that kind of, of thought that, if an employee comes in and understands and sees cool space, and they they think that this is the place where I want to be, and so they're making that investment. Yeah, I think as a trend, we're seeing companies spending more, investing in the design of their space or redesign of their space so that they can maintain employees and compete for that top talent. So I, our unemployment in Des Moines is not necessarily our low unemployment is a national trend. It's not unique to Des Moines, so. And just like our city does a great job of competing nationally, you know, I think you know, we're the fastest growing city north of the Mason-Dixon line. So, I mean, that, that, that says a lot about the character of Greater Des Moines, too. But we have to give credit to our, um, to our partnership. They have put us on the map. I think they've done a great job. So I want to pause of me asking questions. Do you have questions for each other?
Sarah, is there anything, any unique design concepts or ideas that are that you're starting to see maybe trending? We're seeing biophilia make its way into office environments. So is that, that is involving um, nature, plant, you know, just taking that kind of wellness um, side of things. Um, well buildings are starting, I mean, they the well building concept has been around for a while, but employees are more um, asking for that um, of their employers and wanting to make sure that um, the building itself, you know, uh, promotes their health and their well-being. Um, we've seen a, a big trend where, um, you know, they made stairs become much more attractive. Stairs are now a feature in almost every building that you see out there, um, and that's because they're they're encouraging their employees to to utilize them. But nobody wants to go into a back type of a stair to go from one floor to the other. It's just easier to use the elevator. But when there are spaces where you want to be, um, those types of things. So I, I would say the health and and that aspect has really taken off. So the design is an integral part of, I mean, the building design, the structure of the building is an integral part of the design of the whole building. Yeah. And so they're opening up ceilings, they're using stairwells that are open. Those are more secure because yep. people can see. Maybe it's a glass um, structure where the stairs go up and it's lit, so they don't feel they're in that back Correct. hall and it's it's more safe for them. Yeah. And the interesting thing is I just showed um, one of our listings to an individual who was really concerned about where they are now and determining if they were going to renew because the basement has a little moisture and that there's concern about mold. And, you know, that's, again, a landlord who is not reinvesting money into their building and updating. There, there's definitely a, a trend of pressure on landlords to make sure that their mechanical systems are top notch, that the roof doesn't have leaks that's creating mold in the ceiling. Uh, it, it, it really becomes a, an issue because uh, people have sensitivities to it. Do you, do you ever get requests from maybe smaller businesses to come in and just look at the office space to give some small suggestions, you know, as opposed to a full-blown overhaul? Yeah, we do. Um, you know, a couple of, well, it's probably been five, ten years ago when HGTV kind of really came online. We got a lot of people that were like trading spaces type, you know, like let's do, and so they... We've seen a shift away from those like DIY type things and kind of making spaces do things like that. But they are seeing like, will you come in and take a look at our lighting? We're, um, you know, we're looking to upgrade this because we realize that that's really beneficial for our employees. Or talk to us about, um, you know, some of the things that we can do to to give some new life to this without spending a lot of money. So we've helped a lot of people do strategies on on those types of things or to conserve space. So knowing that you know they've amped up their employees, but they don't wanna take on more space. Um, and so how can, we, how can we do things, what strategies are in place that we can still keep the same footprint, but add employees to it? And that is a, a challenge for second generation space in that you know, LED lighting has probably in its fifth or sixth iteration since it was really rolled out 10 or 12 years ago. And what you can do with LED lighting in, in office space right now is amazing versus the old parabolic prisms or, God forbid, even the flat prism lights. And, and so, you know, lighting makes a, a major difference in, in walking into any space, whether it's the coloring of the space, uh, the way the employees feel while they're working. If it's, if it's a harsh blue light, it's really a harsh environment. It bothers a lot of people's eyes versus warm lights make all the difference in the world. So. It, sometimes it can even go too far. I mean, LED can be very, very bright. So we've seen kind of a pullback on some of that where they want to make sure that they can dim down those lights because that's a big adjustment from a client going from a parabolic where it's a fairly dark kind of environment and all of a sudden they're, they're pushing their employees into something that's almost too bright. So there's a push and a pull and I think it's, it's always good to make sure that um, you're getting uh, experts kind of giving you, you know, evaluating those light levels, making sure that there's lighting people out there that, that know exactly what they're doing to make sure that's done right. What sort of sustainability features are we seeing either tenants ask for or new construction be, be you, being used in new construction? Well, energy code really dictates, I mean, 
the latest energy codes out there are driving buildings to be energy efficient. So from that standpoint, um, it's almost, it's part of what they have to do. Um, I think we've seen, you know, for a while there was a lot with, um, uh, lead. yeah, a lot of companies were going towards lead and, and going for the certification. We've seen, I mean, it really pulled back for a while, but we've started seeing it, it engage itself again. I think people, um, there's a mindset out there that they want to be responsible to the environment. Um, and so uh, we've seen a little bit more activity from the, the lead front and actually going for lead certification. Um, I think that's definitely true at new development. Correct, yeah. Um, the part that I'm disappointed in is that when people come in and remodel, they just trash what was there, and a lot of it is in good condition. If nothing else, carefully take it out and take it to Habitat for Humanity or, or something like that. I think we're a little, uh, we're in a hurry, or we say, well, that's more costly because it takes more time to remove it and find a place for it. We need to do more in that, in that area. Yeah, especially from a furniture standpoint. I mean, the last five, 10 years, a lot of people have brought their their panels down, they've, they've um, redeployed their furniture so that it's something where it is more collaborative, but it has caused a lot of waste out there. We're trashing a lot of furniture that could be better utilized. And at the same time, though, landlords have to be careful to make a decision on if a company's leaving, do they let them leave their furniture, do they let them leave their cabling wires, do, you know, what, what do you do and what don't you do? Uh, we've, we've leased and sold buildings that literally had nine foot partitions in them and it was like, there was an eclipse in the space as you walk through it because of the high walls. And, and so, you know, those were taken out and they were carefully recycled, I'm sure. But, I mean, that, that really is a, a challenge for an owner because that's a cost standpoint. And so now in leases, we're actually seeing where those discussions are had in the lease that you will not, you know, that the landlord has the right to ask you to remove all your cables out of the trays or from above the ceilings, however they run. And so that becomes part of the negotiation up front as to how a tenant may exit, whether it's five, 10, or 15 years later. So as we go further into 2020 and into 2021, what concerns do you have as we go down the? I think we need to get through the uh, election and, and we'll see where, where that goes. Uh, it, the, the economy is very strong right now. There's, I was just reading this morning that there's high consumer confidence then, you know, and, and so that's a good thing. Uh, I don't see any clouds or threats necessarily coming in front of us that, that are gonna be really substantial. And, you know, really, I think as technology changes, it'll be changed the way how we use office space. I mean, that'll, that'll be the biggest threat. I don't see that happening in 2021. I mean, I think that's a, 25 to 30, you know, year, the year's 25 to 30 question as to what that's really gonna impact. I think there's going to be less speculative building and the office is in less demand because we're reducing the number of people to do the same amount of work. We're using technology more. So I would really like to see people be a little more, maybe the word short-sighted, or maybe it's long-sighted is what I want vision. to say. Long-term vision. Long -term vision because we're just kind of in, we've been in this process of build it, they will come. You've got the interiors. If you don't use it, you tear it out and you dump it. I just think we need to be a little more long-term in our perspective. And that means sustainability and um, looking at it from that long term. Is that why you think maybe there has been a little bit more of the build a suit as opposed to some of the leasing stuff? The build a suit is going to be headquarters building yeah. their own building. Right. I think it's because number one, they were in properties that maybe um, didn't fit their culture, their experience requirements and what they wanted for an image. Um, so I think they're building their own, but mainly because of low interest rates. And then this way, you know, they can build it, they can own it, and they can control all those things. They can control the property management, they can control the look, the interior, and when you look at these new buildings, they're pretty flexible. They're more open, the furniture is more flexible, but again, some of that is ebb and flow. You learn from the experiences and maybe errors. Like I said, they've gone from 80 inches and 62 inch um, high um, 
office Work systems, station. workstations, and they're now down to maybe 42 inches. And, and so it's, it's just, everything's more open, and I think it is more, con, you know, more conscientious of sustainability and the future. But the main reason has been low interest rates. I think some of these companies are also looking for identity. Mm -hmm. I mean, something that is their key, you know, mm -hmm. building, so that when they are trying to recruit folks, mm -hmm. that's something that they have that identifies their brand. We've, we've had our industrial panel the other day and talking about the use of industrial for office. Is, is that a, also a kind of a, con, not maybe not a specific concern, but are you guys having to be more familiar with that space and, and how to use that, uh, that yeah. type of real estate? You know, for the right applications, it's a, it's an, it's really gets down to cost, and it's really about getting the cost of the shell down to a very low number, and then putting, again, the high amenities, whether it's you know natural plants in the building, uh, the air conditioning system, the heating system, the amenities for a gym, the you know cafeteria, whatever, that all becomes part of the discussion of the psyche of that company. But I mean it. It offers a really nice um, palette to really kind of just kind of create whatever somebody wants in in that box. So, uh, yeah, I think like the flex warehouse type that was really attracting some some companies. Um, you know, it's the volume. It's that you can you can kind of play with anything. I think one of the biggest challenges for those is also natural light, though. You know, I mean, and we saw that in, in approaching acoustics, like not. Not every office environment needs to have a 20-some foot ceiling, and so how do you approach some of those things? Um, so I, I see it kind of balancing itself out. I don't think we're you know, going to see a ton of companies going that way, but I still think we're going to see um, it occur for some that makes sense. And again, that, that's just a culture that those companies create for their employees. Chris, you mentioned in the first part of your question, do you have to know about that other property, that other asset type? Growing up in the industry and growing up with Des Moines in the industry, I've always chosen to be familiar with all asset types because you'll have a client who goes down one path, especially investments, and they purchase an office building. Okay, that's great. The next thing you know, they're purchasing a multifamily, and then the next thing is industrial building, and then they want land. So in our market, in the size of our market, um, I, th I think we are pr fairly familiar with as all asset types rather than just focusing on one area. And the reason being is just what you asked. Well, what if they really want to be in an industrial because of the cost or because of the features? Um, I think it's important to be aware in our market. Especially in light of the fact that there's been so much repurposing, whether it's the old uh, look building downtown, which is a, a condo now, or, or some of the other building projects I mentioned before is downtown projects were repurposed. You know, I think we may start seeing that with our malls. We may start seeing that with you know, just different spaces. I was just going to ask specifically about retail, and you, you mentioned that there's not as much um, office space in that smaller, under 10,000 square. Is, is retail an option, you know, some of the empty retail space? It could be. Again, it's, it's about location, location. And you know, as the suburbs expand, you know, it's really where, where those companies want to domicile. So, you know, West Des Moines held their own and, you know, attracted salmons, kept salmons. Uh, Waukee got Holmes Murphy. Uh, Ankeny's had some success, and, you know, Casey's continues to expand there. It really just depends on really where somebody wants to expand to. You know, Altoona's looking for that first big office deal that they haven't gotten yet. So, I mean, everybody's, as the su suburbs expand, where people office is is going to you know make a difference, but it really has to do with where their employees are and what their base is too. From a desi design standpoint, I think retail offers a lot of um, unique things, and and so I I could see that you know we get excited about some of the the opportunities that they have within those buildings of of how you could get people and bring people together. You could share amenities because they're larger spaces. Um, so I think it could have some real interest. Um, We'll see. Retail is no different than office in that its whole life is changing in front of their eyes. So retail has to be looked at as an experience for the, the user coming into the space. And that's the same thing we've been saying the whole time about office. It's an experience. And the both of them have experienced this issue because of technology. 
you know, building. So I think you have to look at them in, in a similar way. There's less retail in brick and mortar because people do it online. The office is reducing because technology has allowed us to do more work with fewer people. So those two are experiencing kind of down the same path. And you have to be very creative to constantly look at, well, I know it's a mall right now, but what could it be? It should be a senior citizen. It could be a library. It could be athletic facility. It could be smaller shops. There's, there's other uses. Of, and that was very evident, as you talked about, in the um, early 2000s and actually the downturn of, depending on what city you lived in, 2006 or 2009. Sorry. Yeah, any, any of those eras, because if you're a larger city, you experience it sooner. But we've had a lot of wonderful repurposing. For example, the Liberty Building, it has a Hyatt, and it has condos, and it has you know, gr great space for hospitality. Um, you, you look at some of the other buildings, and they've been repurposed. You have to be very creative and not look at it for what it is, but what it could be. So this has been great. We've about out of time. I want to go down the... the line here and just any closing thoughts you have on the office sector and we'll start with Brittany. All right, I think we will have uh, a good 2020. I know there are a few larger uh, tenants that are going to be coming out in the market and looking for space so hopefully we'll be able to take some of that uh, second generation space that we'll be getting back from some of the other large tenants um, leased up. I think that everything's kind of cyclical, and so I think that what we're seeing right now will, you know, eventually this will be the trend that will go away, and, and um, we'll see kind of a different approach. But I think helping people and employers kind of future-proof themselves to some degree to make sure that the real estate strategies that they're making right now um, will will give them opportunity in the future to, to adjust to how people are working and, and the changes that are happening. But I think it's kind of an exciting time because of the technology shifts um, and what you can do with office space. I agree that it's very exciting times in, in the office market right now, and I think 2020 is going to be a wonderful year for the office market. You know, I, I think the, in closing, the one thing I will say is that we're seeing our clients and people we talk to about becoming our clients are taking a longer view so that what they do today works five years from now and then they want the ultimate flexibility as to what they're going to be doing in year six and they, they don't know so and it's really because a lot of the trends that we talked about here today so it's very interesting that I think that uh, tenants are looking they're very introspective right now and looking longer term as to what what does this mean for us is is how we use our space to piggyback on that concept that you're all talking about um, i think it's important to work with your clients and help them build in buyouts and um, you know to be able to get out of a current lease if it does not match their needs because you know we used to plan out five years people are now planning out one year because things are changing so quickly for them. So we're working really hard to say, okay, you need the, the, the safety net built into your lease terminology so that, okay, if you don't grow as fast as you think you will, we've got a buyout, you know what the cost is, and we do an analysis and show them what it's going to cost. If um, they think they want to take extra space, then we build in more than a first drive refusal. We hold it for them. So there's lots of that that needs to be done. Um, I think the other thing that's interesting is going back through the years and looking at reports that we've done or presentations like this and finding that the actual rental rates have not changed that much over 30 years. There's been a relativity to everything else. You know, it's not like uh, the net rates have just climbed. They're, they've gone up, you know, two, four percent. Yeah, you know, Jen, I'd, I'd say that Really, what's really funny about the Des Moines market, and unlike other parts of the country, is that it's really, you can tell what building was built in 1980, what building was built in 1990, and 2000, 2010, really by the pricing on the base rent. And we've really been stuck, and, and because it became a landlord's market over the last four or five years, we finally, you know, we've seen landlords starting to increase rates on base rates, even on 30-year-old product, and, and so we've seen some bumps, but if you're looking at a new building like the Westfield building in, 
in, in R and R space. It's a beautiful building, but it's the most expensive building in the state of Iowa. Which, if that's what somebody wants, it's a phenomenal building to be in. You know, and there's it's it's a gorgeous building. I wish I was there. But anyway, but you know, with that could said, be. at the same huh? could be at the same time. Yeah, we could be. Oh, but you know, at the same time, you know, the 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 pricing is really constricted by. Or, or the, the market's constricted by construction costs right now, which are extremely high. But I was just going to try to sneak in a final question because yeah. we, we've talked about construction costs on almost each of the other panels, and so that's probably why it didn't come up specifically today. But if, if I'm a new, if I'm a business and I'm looking and I want to be constructing my own, my own, what what should I be expecting right now in terms it of? Are you starting with the warm shell, or are you starting <laughs> from the outside? Yeah, it, it, you know, Chris, we've seen you know on some of these builder suits. I think you know you can price anywhere from. 150 to 300 dollars a square foot, easily mm -hmm. all in, you know, land included, and so it's really what the company wants to buy, what or you know what they want in their environment. Uh, you know, the the John Deere building out in Urbandale is was was built by Brian, and it's really a very economical building. It looks, you know, it's a precast building. It you know it's it's fairly simple in structure. But it's a beautiful building, and it's very fun. It's highly functional, and so it just depends on what people want. But the cost, your, your net rents, will be determined by the cost of construction. Construction is up 20, 22 percent over. Cost of construction. The cost of construction has gone up at least 20 to 22 percent in the last two years total. And so the the thing you have to remember is the cost of the construction drives the net rental rate, but you have to remember. Construction costs the same thing regardless if it's in, in the suburbs or downtown. The difference is the cost of the land. That will differ. It's going to be less expensive in the western suburbs than probably downtown because you're doing infill, typically. So my point is there's been an increase in first-generation space because it's new construction. So if you can find an older building that could work for your needs and you, if you can afford to make the improvements, then that's probably the better way to go. But that's not what new companies are wanting to do. They're building their signature building. Yeah, I mean, we're just seeing that so many people are busy right now. So construction costs are, are rising at a rapid rate just because people have work to do. And so um, that's, that's really dramatically affected pricing. I think the data centers have pulled some of the trades yeah, off of um, some of the office projects. Um, and so that's what's helping to increase that cost of construction. Um, like you said, they have work to do, so your job's not always as important as the one they have. Um, but we're also seeing companies spending more money on top of the high construction costs just in trying to create a unique space with the design itself. So you're seeing higher end finishes, which then increases the cost. Which is All right, well, I snuck in that last question, so that's why we went long, so I'll, I'll take the blame for it. Uh, to our audience, thank you for joining us. Uh, we always appreciate it. Our, our best stories always come from the folks that are, are watching and interacting with the content and the stories that we're writing in our, our panels. If something today uh, spurred a thought for you or spurred a story idea, feel free to reach out to Kathy Bolton. Her contact information will be up on the screen. Uh, she's always looking for stories for a commercial real estate uh, weekly e-newsletter. You can sign up for that at businessrecord.com slash sign up. Uh, this is one of five roundtables that we're doing for our annual real estate magazine. And you can check out all of them at businessrecord.com slash A-R-E-M. Uh, again, my name is Chris Kineski. I'm the publisher and editor of The Business Record. My contact information is on the screen as well. Feel free to reach out my way. I'd be happy to talk to you. And lastly, to our panelists, thank you for a great job again today. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris.